All right, well, our next speaker does not need an introduction. I guess you guys, do you guys have the program guide, by the way? All right, so without other further ado, I'm just going to just ask him to come on stage. Hey. Hey, good morning, Brock. Good morning. How's it going? It's, uh, it's good. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. I know, did you fly in from Puerto Rico or? I flew in last night from Los Angeles. Uh, we had the, um, the first screening or the premiere of oh, a that's film right. called Play Money. That's right, that's right. And so I went from the screening to the airport to here to a friend's birthday to this. Nice. Well, we, we thank you for coming and we'll let you get started. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, glad to be back in round two for Kurt Kumar. Thank you. Um, well, I guess good morning. Uh, everyone get enough sleep? <laughs> yeah. um, want to just, um, I guess, take a moment on kind of the crypto space. We've had a, uh, quite the exciting ride over the last year and a half. Um, clearly, the, the last month maybe not uh, as nice as some of it, but uh, I don't know if we have audio. But this is um, just kind of the ICO market, which has been the craze and the thing that's disrupting all of sort of venture. And so I was one of the five founding board members of MasterCoin, which the first ICO was in August of 2013. And for a very long time, the ICO sort of structure was not something people would use because if you could raise venture capital, you would. Very few, on, the people that were doing ICOs in the early days either were those that were tinkering and wanting to experiment with these new ideas, or they were the ones that you know, couldn't raise any money elsewhere. But when, when the Dow happened, that's when all of a sudden people said, this model can raise what? 100 million, $150 million? That's when the best entrepreneurs in the world said, wait, this might be an interesting alternative to venture capital. Now, even though I've got a term sheet from Andreessen Horowitz, maybe I don't want it. And so um, this is what we've been experiencing, and this is going to be uh, uh, the thing that disrupts all of venture. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Historically, not to talk down on, on California and certainly the Bay Area here, having been a VC, but historically, if you wanted to be an entrepreneur, you needed to be on the West Coast of the United States to have any real likelihood of seeing your dreams become reality. And that's because the capital formation was here. The resources were here. If you were an entrepreneur in middle America, you know, Puerto Rico, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, the likelihood of your dreams becoming a reality were near zero. This sort of disruptive event, what the ICO is doing here is it's, it's breaking and changing the model for capital formation at the earliest stages, making it so that anyone anywhere you know, will have the same level of access to pursuing their dreams and those dreams having the potential to become a reality. The next Vitalik Buterin, the next Dan Larimer, the next Mark Zuckerberg, you know, could be from anywhere. Um, obviously, very exciting stuff. Oops. And then that, oops, we get brought into bubble. The context <laughs> is worth noting. Um, I started my, my first real business in 1997. And so I lived through the internet 1.0 crash, lost nearly $100 million of other people's money. Oops. Um, but uh, during that time period, it was very similar to what we're experiencing now in 1999. But the internet had gotten up to an aggregate market cap, these technology stocks of 6.7 trillion at the time. And this is when internet usage wasn't looking that different than how sort of cryptocurrency and blockchain usage is looking today. Um, actually, we're seeing more revenue, um, I think, coming out of this sector than we did the internet at the same point. You know, the earlier comments that VCs would have two years ago is, where's the revenue, where are the exits, where are the revenue, where's the exits? But we got up to 6.7 when it was a, primarily a Western-based phenomenon, and this is not inflation-adjusted. I think I can make an argument with quantitative easing being the way that it is, that number should be 50 or 100 trillion. 
And that's talking about the, the potential value of an emerging new industry. So, you know, when we talk about bubbles, um, I don't think this is the bubble. The bubble is probably the existing stock market and debt markets and things of that nature. But um, it's just good to see context. And in all this, you know, these times where there's so much opportunity and opportunity for bad decisions to be made, you know, I, I like to try to bring everybody always back down to ground and remember that it's, you know, we're, we're creating a, a brave new world and integrity, you know, is the sort of thing that you never, ever want to compromise. You know, as we talk about systems of technology that are providing greater transparency, you know, accountability, uh, immutability, you know, what are the things that you want on your immutable record? What do you want to be known for? How do you want to be known? You know, and these are the things to think about because it's that reputation that will ultimately determine what you're able to do in this space over time. Guard it, protect it with everything you have. Don't make any compromises. Don't let the, the short-term fear of missing out or opportunity get you to make a bad moral or ethical decision. Never, ever compromise your integrity. This is kind of the most important thing I can teach anyone because it's that thing that you can spend your entire life trying to build and develop and you can lose it in a second. Um, so just kind of a constant reminder of other things to be mindful of right now. Make sure you're paying your taxes if you're you know, in the US. Um, I mean, th this industry is, we're no longer in the, the, the beginning years. You know, we were on easy street. You know, most of the sector wouldn't say that, but I'd say it's been easy street up and until now. You know, the sector is now getting big. It's you know, Bank of America and JP Morgan said that Bitcoin is an existential threat to their business. That's not easy street anymore. So make sure as you think about these things that you're doing what's right, but also make sure you're abiding by the law right now. Um, make sure that you're getting well advised. I mean, I've been giving these talks on this subject in particular since like 2013 as everyone's like, hey, this industry's not regulated. I'm like, uh, yeah, it is. There's a lot of laws from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, et cetera, that are relevant. You know, you've got the SEC calling it a security, the CFTC calling it a commodity, FinCEN calling it a currency, the IRS calling it property. You know, make sure as you're playing in this space that you are being well advised by legal counsel um, because the, make, make sure you do things the right way. Um, and there is a right way to do things. Most importantly, don't compromise your personal integrity. But let's move off. Back to uh, kind of what is it that we're trying to do with ourselves and how is it that you can be most successful in this space? Um, if you're new to the space, I say spend six months, you know, figuring out how to help people, get to know people. And in that process, you know, in, in life, this, this Japanese term, ikigai, I, I find the key to finding your own life's purpose, and that can change over time. You're not stuck with one. But, you know, so, much, so many of us go through our lives waking up in the morning to go do things that we don't like, to make money, you know, to buy things that we don't need, so on and so forth. But this is where I found my drive. <laughs> and that's in figuring out what you're good at, figuring out what you love, and figuring out what the world needs. You don't really need to look at this bottom section of what gets you paid. It's kind of irrelevant, because if you figure out what you're good at, what you love, and what the world needs, and you find the center of that, I promise you, well, money is not going to be the thing that you're going to care about it. And if you're doing what you're really good at and what the world needs, the money will follow. It doesn't actually need to be part of your plan at all. Um, and so I like to talk about the idea that, you know, we're all superheroes or at least have the potential to be. And what I mean by that is like Malcolm Gladwell, you know, talks about the things that you've invested 10,000 hours into. You know, these are the skills, you know, that you've uniquely refined over the course of your life. You know, these are the skills that make you unique. And when you combine that skill with that life purpose of knowing what you love, and that's probably why you put the 10,000 hours in, but also what the world needs, 
when you start to put these pieces together, it's when, you know, you get to start to live that extremely fulfilling life, which also is largely about living an integrated life. You know, a lot of people would be like, ah, Brock, why do you, why do you dress like this? You know, a lot of people have a public persona and a private persona. They've got a public life and a private life. You know, I live in a glass house. I'm not any different between, you know, behind closed doors, as you'll see me right now. And there's something very powerful in life about being integrated in yourself. You know, it's kind of like on that airplane when the masks come down to take care of yourself before, about, before taking care of others. You know, until you've got yourself in alignment, it's really hard to, to have the impact on others as you might like. And we all have that sort of potential. And we can all do extraordinary things in the world. Um, I always have to throw a Burning Man slide in here somewhere. <laughs> it's not, this is, this is the only probably Burning Man reference in here, but uh, I just, I love this, this shot. And the story of it is actually one I've never told, but I will, because it hangs on my wall uh, at one of the places where I like to stay. Uh, but this is a, a piece by an artist, uh, Laura Kimpton, and photographed by uh, Peter Ruprecht, um, who was kind of having his moment of like, am I doing the right thing with my life? You know, I've walked away from everything to become a photographer when, you know, I was at McKinsey and doing this and doing that, and I was, but I wasn't feeling fulfilled in my life. I felt a calling that I should be running around with a camera and capturing moments and creating, you know, these beautiful pieces of art. But, you know, along the way, sometimes you start to go, ah, oh, maybe I, I'm not making the money. Life is difficult. Maybe I, maybe, why did I get off that treadmill? Maybe I get, should get back on that treadmill. Um, and so he's having one of those moments and then, you know, all of a sudden he's like, give me a sign. And the clouds break and the sun comes out just as this and he's like, he jumps on his bike, goes cruising over to, to this sign. He gets there. There's no people there at the moment. And he's just looking at this beautiful believe in the way that the clouds and the sun is coming through. And he's like, wow, this is beautiful. But anyone can take this shot. Can't you give me a little more? And literally as he's having this thought, an art car drives up, double-decker, behind this, and it starts unloading people one by one on the top of these letters. And he's just sitting there with his camera, and he's like, wow, this is great, but this is someone else's shot. Who is this photographer that is like orchestrated this so perfectly? Whoa, it doesn't get this good. And then he's like looking around for the photographer. There's no music. They're not dancing. They're just standing there in this pose, and he's like, where's the photographer? And the, and the, and the bus drives off. And he's like, it's not appropriate, to, you know, he's a professional not to take someone else's shot, but I don't think anyone's taken this shot. Is this for me? I guess it is. He gets one shot, click, and then the bus immediately comes up and all the people get on and they're gone. And he's like, all right, ask and ye shall receive. Believe. Um, I like to talk about this stuff, which is... Um, uh, well, I, when contacted by, you know, sort of Forbes and all their talk of, you know, what they describe as a billionaire, my view is that I fundamentally disagree with that definition. I like the idea of upgrading systems. You know, it's no longer about, you know, one of the Burning Man principles is uh, leave no trace. I, I prefer this sort of upgraded model, which is leave it better than you found it. You know, it's going from sustainable to regeneration, you know, and where in life and how in life can we make as big an impact as possible. And this is, you know, kind of one of the core principles that I live by, which is, you know, a billionaire is not someone that has stored a billion dollars of value for themselves, which, you know, money is just stored energy. Energy doesn't like to be trapped and stored. Energy likes to flow like water. And so these are the sorts of experiments that that we're trying to run here, but it's the idea that a billionaire is someone that's positively impacting the lives of a billion people. And the projects that I'm interested in, you know, getting involved with and supporting to the best of my abilities, obviously I'm here to help everyone as much as I can, but are those projects that are, you know, have this kind of focus, you know, because in that Forbes sort of list, you've got these people that have figured out how to play the game of compounding interest. They're the best at it in the world. And they're really, really good at it. 
And what I'm trying to encourage people to realize is that that's not the only game in town. You know, you can get good at compounding interest, but how about trying compounding impact? You know, the ideas of sort of conscious capital. Um, less about storing that energy and more about letting that energy flow in a way that benefits everybody. You know, the idea of, you know, transforming that, that me, you know, into we. And that's the big thing that's happening right now is we start to see these decentralized autonomous corporations or communities emerge is you're seeing a new system, a new architecture, where it's no longer to be successful, it's not about doing what's in your own self-interest. To build a successful business now is not about doing what's in the business's best interest. These next generation of sort of communities that are forming, is, it's about just that. It's ultimately, you're building community. You know, it's about serving your community first. If you do what's in the best interest of your community first, always, that's the sort of community that's going to thrive. You know, the community that's got leadership that isn't benevolent, but leadership that's trying to line their own pockets, clearly are not building the type of culture that's going to evolve into what it is that, you know, you hopefully are setting out to build. I mean, for example, the way that I pick projects um, and the things that are being built out there today is, do I think this community is going to be successful? Do I think this community is going to continue to attract, you know, more community members? And that's, you know, I don't really look so much at the technology per se, because the technology is a bit commoditized in an open source world. The technology just gives you a first mover advantage. That's it. If it's open source, that's it. And if you fail to capture a network effect quickly, you're going to, you know, again, you have no technology differentiator at that point. And so the real differentiator in what separates, you know, the winning projects from those that won't are how well did they foster a community. It's, it's really all about community building and community leadership. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um... I wouldn't be doing, I, I got to bring up Puerto Rico always, <laughs> and specifically the, uh, the connecting of those dots. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, or whatever you choose. Um, Puerto Rico has been a, a, a focus because it's a beautiful place. It's, a, it's an enchanted island, wonderful, wonderful people. More artists per capita than any part of the United States. And they're people that have been kind of dealt the short stick for a long, long time. And they're in a tough spot. They had three and a half million people. Now, about three million people. But those Half a million people that have left are those that possess a lot of the intellectual capital, the human capital, the financial capital, those with the means to leave. You know, it's, uh, they've been experiencing a brain drain. And the only way that you can combat a brain drain or something like that when you've lost nearly 20% of your population with a lot of the core resources is with a brain gain. And that's what we're trying to bring down there. So if, uh, if you didn't make it to the last Restart Week, would love to get uh, you involved. We're launching Restart Ventures to finance not just blockchain-related things, but everything down in Puerto Rico. Restart Week, the next one is May 6th to the 13th on the west coast of the island. In Mayaguez, you have a population of 100,000 people there, 20,000 of which are college students. So this is where the top university is. This is where all the students are. The students that historically haven't had the tools available for them to dream, you know, and have those dreams become a reality. The entrepreneurial dream is something that hadn't really been available to Puerto Rico. So we can put venture funds, accelerators, co-working facilities, angel investors, mentors, advisors, etc. We can bring a lot of that talent to those 20,000 college students, which are the next generation of Puerto Ricans, and give them without having to leave, which they can still do if they want, but 
you know, we can help those dreams become a reality right then and there. I hope some of you uh, come on down there and live a life in service. And it's a beautiful place. We just wrapped up in, in San Juan. Uh, lots of blue tarps there. A lot of, there's still some people, I think 400 homes without water. You're still looking at over 10% of the population without electricity. And so, I mean, the, the big thing in coming down there is checking out the island, you know, getting to know its people, getting to know its culture, getting to know its needs, and figuring out how to use those superpowers, those Malcolm Gladwell skills that you have in service with no expectation of anything in return. You know, that's the sort of foundation we're trying to build down there, you know, and helping Puerto Rico with its restart. I'll close out on this because we lost a, uh, an extraordinary man on Pi Day on March 14th who uh, wrote a speech that I find to be very inspiring right now. Hopefully the, uh, the audio works on this. Do we have audio? See ourselves as a whole. There we go. More volume. Please. Please. See ourselves as a whole. Yeah, turn it up. When we see the Earth from space, we see ourselves as a whole. We see the unity and not the divisions. One planet. One human race. We are not the same, but we are one. We are here together, and we need to live together with tolerance and respect. Our only boundaries are the way we see ourselves. The only borders, the way we see each other. We must become global citizens. Our voices are important. We give our elected officials their power. And we can take it away. Be involved. We are all time travelers, traveling together into the future. But let us make that future a place we want to visit. Be brave. Be determined. Overcome the odds. It can be done. So, um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here on this aircraft carrier uh, with the uh, Hornet. I'll be hanging out for a little while and then making my beeline out. And so, thank you. Great to see you all.